very good morning to each one of you. We are so glad to have you worship with us this morning. And to begin our worship service, let us sing in light of Christmas season, the song, O come all ye faithful. The words say, come let us adore him, Christ the Lord. <laughs> Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for this beautiful morning you've given us. Thank you so much that we can glorify your name, exalt you, God. Thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lord, as we go on with our service, we pray that it would be a pleasing aroma before your sight. It would be one that truly glorifies your name. And God, I pray that you would be with those who are watching, that you would bless each one of them too. Thank you so much for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, I'll read for y'all a passage from the book of Micah. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And it goes, But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. You know, Bethlehem was a small town in compared to the bigger cities that were around it. And one would wonder why God would choose such an insignificant small town for the birth of his one and only son. And it doesn't often make sense to us what God does. But the thing is, God is not interested in the world's definition of greatness. And I read somewhere, uh, it says, isn't it just so beautiful that what God can do in someone's life is not limited to their earthly status. And Jesus' birth in a small town of Bethlehem is such a reminder of that. So our next song is, O Little Town of Bethlehem. O Little Town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep Ever 
prepare to hear God's word. Let us sing this song. We just love this song, Yeshu Masi. And during this Christmas season, it's so apt because it says, God, you, uh, you sent Jesus to die for our sin. And that is why God sent Jesus. And that is why we celebrate Christmas. And uh, so even as we prepare our hearts, shall we sing this song prayerfully? Yeshu Masi Tere jaisa hai koi nahi Tere charno mein chuke asma Aur mari maga hai zami Yeshu Masi Tere jaisa hai koi nahi Amara 
Isn't it exciting? We're just one week away from Christmas. As I look back, I want to stop this morning and say, God, how good you are. Your mercies have been new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. We want to praise his holy name. Um, as a family, we want to thank each one of you for your prayers, for your support, for your encouragement right through the year 2023. And we're excited as we think of this Christmas season. We're praying that our services will help draw people closer to the one who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Most of you know that the theme of our meditation this Christmas season has been hope that enables us to overcome all hopelessness. Hope to overcome hopelessness. What have we been doing in this particular season? We've been looking at those old Christmas stories again. We've been looking at familiar Christmas stories. We're reading the first couple of chapters of Matthew and the first couple of chapters of Luke and we are looking at the characters in that first Christmas story and the lesson we are picking up is a beautiful one. We're looking at Elizabeth and Zachariah and we're seeing what appears to be terrible pain from their perspective is the glorious plan of Yahweh. We're looking at Mary and what appears to be terrible pain from her perspective is the glorious plan of Yahweh. We're looking at all of the characters in that first Christmas story and we're looking at their pain as they look at life from their perspective and we're beginning to discern the glorious plans of Yahweh. And what we are coming away with is that as we go through our journey of faith, as we seek to walk with God, there will be these times of pain in our life but what the Bible reminds us and what the message of Christmas is all about is that God the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is working his most beautiful plans in our life as we walk through those valleys of pain. And I think the Christmas story itself is the grandest and the most beautiful representation of God's great hope in the midst of hopelessness. Men and women, boys and girls had lived in bondage for years and years, brokenness from their perspective, hopelessness. And then 2,000 years ago, in the fullness of time, God sent His only begotten Son, the most glorious hope, the hope that dispels all hopelessness, hope that helps us to overcome all hopelessness. This morning, we want to look at the story of Joseph. And again, Joseph's story is no different from all of the stories we've looked at in the past couple of weeks. It's a story that appears to be painful from the perspective of Joseph and yet, and yet is beautiful as you look at the glorious plans of God in the life of Joseph. And so this morning, let's open our Bibles to Matthew's Gospel chapter 1 and I'm going to read for you from verse 18 down to verse 25. And as I do that, here's what I want you to begin to think about. Think about the pain that Joseph is experiencing as he is going through the season in his life and also start to think about the plan of God in the life of Joseph. That's our message for this morning. The pain that Joseph is experiencing and yet as you look at the story of Joseph, we begin to come 
come away with the glorious plan of God. And so this morning as I read this passage, if you have a pen or a paper or a pencil, start to write down. What are some of the pains that Joseph is experiencing as he goes through this season in his life? And yet what is God's plan for Joseph in this particular season of life? Matthew chapter 1, I'm beginning to read to you at verse 18. The Bible says, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was, a, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. As you look at that story, the story of Joseph, there are many, many lessons that you can pick up this morning. But like I said, I want to divide our message into two parts. The pain of the life of Joseph and yet the glorious plan of Yahweh God. As I look at this particular passage of scripture, I wrote down four words as I think about the pains of Joseph. Number one, Joseph felt deceived. Number two, Joseph felt devastated. Number three, Joseph felt deprived. And then as you read the whole story of Joseph, the fourth lesson is Joseph felt great discomfort. Let me repeat those words and then we're going to look at each one of them. Number one, Joseph felt deceived. Number two, Joseph felt devastated. Number three, Joseph felt deprived. Number four, Joseph felt great discomfort. Look with me at those four lessons as we consider the pain that Joseph is going through in this season of his life. Number one, Joseph felt deceived. The Bible says in verse 18 and 19 of Matthew chapter 1, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. I wrote down these four words about Joseph. Number one, Joseph was a man who had walked his life uh, in, in separation. Joseph was a man who'd walked a sanctified and a separated life. As you're looking at the Bible, the Bible says Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. Please keep in mind that Joseph Joseph lived in very, very dark times. This was the time when Herod ruled. This was a time when there was great godlessness. But in that godless season, Joseph was one man who was faithful to the law of God. He was faithful to the word of God. He was walking in accordance with God's desire for his life. So number one, this was a man of separation. This was a man of sanctification. He had been walking a pure walk. He had had kept his life clean so that he and Mary can be united together and they can bring uh, they, they can they can have a family that would bring God the honor and the praise the second word that I put down in my notes about Joseph is jo Joseph is not only a man of separation and sanctification he's a man of steadfastness he is steadfastly working towards his marriage in fact marriage in the time of Mary and Joseph was something that was very elaborate once a couple was pledged to be married, sometimes it took even a year as they prepared for marriage. There was great steadfastness. And so here was Joseph. He was not only a man of separation and sanctification, he was a man of steadfastness. Every day preparing himself for that glorious day when Mary and he will be united. Walking in purity and holiness before God. Walking steadfastly before God. This was a man that truly was 
was preparing himself for what would have been one of the most glorious moments of his life. The third word I put down in, the, in my notes about Joseph is that this is a man of sincerity. Even just the way in which he wants to deal with Mary, this is a man of sincerity. Please keep in mind that Joseph is not fully able to understand. When Mary tells him, Joseph, this is what happened. The angel Gabriel appeared to me and the angel Gabriel said to me that I have been chosen of all of the women's, women of the world. God has chosen me so that he can bring his only begotten son into this world. I was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. Now, you know something, Joseph is not able to understand that because Joseph is saying, you know what, from my human perspective, what you're saying is very difficult to understand. How can I explain this to my parents? How can I explain this to my friends that the lady that I'm going to get married to is pregnant and that pregnancy is because God in many ways has overshadowed her. But as you look at the text here, you realize that even in a time of such incredible pressure, you find Joseph as a very sincere man. You see what the Bible says, he did not want to expose Mary to public disgrace and he wanted to divorce her quietly. Most men in the time of Joseph would have made a huge hue and cry about it. Mary would have brought, been brought before people. She would have been stoned to death because what she had done uh, in the eyes of people would have been a violation of the law of Moses. But you see what the Bible says? The Bible says Joseph is such a sincere man. Even in a moment when he is uncertain, he is so sincere in the way in which he deals with Mary. So number one, he's a man who's walked his life in separation, steadfast in sanctification. Number two, he's been a man who's walked his life in steadfastness. Number three, he's a man of sincerity. And number four, he is a man who's made many sacrifices. You see, as you look at Joseph, he has made many, many sacrifices in his life so that he can keep himself pure for this moment when Mary and he can come together in a bond of marriage. I remember when our daughters were young, when they were teenagers, at that time, there was something called the purity ring that was making the round. The purity ring is when parents will take this purity ring, pray with their children, put that ring on their finger and say, you know what? God wants you to keep your pure. He wants you to keep yourself pure. He wants you to walk in holiness. You would have many who will come along who would want to have relationships with you. You would have temptations because the way in which God has made us is that we are attracted to people of the opposite sex and we are all beings that, that, that desire sexual satisfaction. But when in, in those moments, may this purity ring remind you that there is a man, there is a partner that God has chosen for you, that in his right time, God will bring that partner into your life. So keep yourself pure as you look forward to that time of marriage. And I remember Maya and I gave both our daughters these purity rings and we prayed with them that they would keep their lives separated so that when they get married, they would give to God and they would give to their spouse a gift that would be truly God honoring and God exalting. So if you're looking at the story of Joseph, that's the kind of life he's led. A man of sanctification separation, a man of steadfastness, a man of sincerity, and a man who's made many sacrifices. And yet, as you look at verses 18 and 19 of Matthew chapter 1, that man feels so deceived, isn't it? He feels so let down. He is absolutely crushed. He says, God, why is this happening to me? I've walked according to your word. I've been steadfast. I've made every sacrifice. I've been sincere, God. Why is this happening to me? Why is Mary pregnant before I've got married to her? So number one, Joseph goes through a season where he feels deceived. He feels let down. He's saying to himself, why is all this happening in my life? The second lesson that I pick up is that Joseph is not only feeling deceived, he's feeling devastated. You see, if you're looking at this particular text, the Bible says Joseph had considered to, to divorce Mary quietly. He didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. And then he has this dream where the angel of the Lord speaks to him and the angel of the Lord tells him, hey, please take Mary home to be your wife because what, is, uh, what she's going to conceive is from the Lord. You will name him Jesus for 
he will uh, save his people from their sins. And uh, this is what the, uh, the prophet spoke about. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call his, uh, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. But if you come down with me to verse 24, the Bible says, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. Now, when you mark that in your Bible, when you look at that verse in your Bible, what you don't realize is that must have been one of the most devastating moments in Joseph's life. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that because of two reasons. Can you imagine up to that particular point, you know, Joseph had made many preparations for his wedding. He had been pledged to be married to Mary and he had made many preparations. The reason there was a season before marriage after the uh, pledge or after the betrothal or after the engagement is so that the man would make many preparations. Preparations for what? For two things. Preparations for his marriage and preparations for life after marriage. But you see what happens in verse 24. The Bible says he woke up and he took Mary home to be his wife. So the first thing that happens is Joseph does not experience the joy of a wedding. No wedding. Can you imagine that? Joseph had lived his life waiting for that day when he would be married. Joseph had lived his life thinking about um, the, his best men, thinking about the celebration, thinking about all of the fanfare, thinking about the, the little excitements, thinking about the new clothes. You know, when you think about weddings right now, many of you know that our family is in wedding season and, you know, weddings can, it just lasts a moment, right? The wedding service itself is 45 minutes and maybe the whole affair is just a couple of hours, but there's so much of preparation that goes in, isn't it? You want to buy the right clothes, you want to have the correct color, colors of decoration, you want to have the right lighting, you want to have the right food. Can you imagine Joseph has been systematically making all of those plans? And then in one moment, no wedding. Can you imagine how devastating that would be? You know, I know of young people who, who, you know, just because they want to get married in a particular church, they want, they, they grew up in a particular church, so they want to get married in that particular church. Now they're staying thousands of miles away. They would spend thousands and thousands and thousands and maybe lakhs of rupees to still come back and just have that joy of walking down that altar, uh, walking down that aisle, uh, having that marriage in that particular church. But stop and think about it. In one moment, Joseph is at a place where he's not going to ever experience the joy of an earthly wedding. No weddings. He just takes Mary home as his wife. Now, the second word that I put down in the devastation of Joseph is no well-wishers. You know, Joseph must have really struggled. It would, have been a, it would have been really difficult for Joseph's own family to believe this story. They might have even suspected Joseph. They might never have believed Joseph. Joseph had no wedding and Joseph also possibly had no well-wishers. But what is beautiful is that the Bible says when Joseph woke up, he did exactly what he was told. He obeyed the Lord. He walked in obedience to God, even in the most devastating time. So number one, Joseph felt deceived. Number two, Joseph felt devastated. Number three, Joseph goes through what I think is a period of feeling deprived. Look at verse 25. The Bible says, he took Mary home to be his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he named him Jesus. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that powerful? Joseph takes Mary, but Joseph has no union with Mary. How difficult is that? There are two words I put down. Joseph is absolutely cautious in the way in which he treats Mary before Jesus is born. And secondly, I put down the word, Joseph in many ways keeps himself from a closeness to Mary, physical closeness to Mary. And you know, in, in fact, when you think about marriages, when we think about coming together with our partner, one of the greatest joys of that union is physical intimacy, just closeness with our partner, enjoying that oneness, celebrating our togetherness, just enjoying to, uh, the, our times together. But stop and think about it. Joseph does not have that joy. Joseph has to get 
married to Mary, he has to take Mary home and then he does not consummate the marriage with Mary until Jesus Christ is born. Can you imagine all that Joseph is going through? He's feeling deceived. He's feeling devastated. He's going through a season when he is deprived of the joys that should have been his. Can you stop and think about that for a moment? God, why am I going through this? The first day I'm with my wife, I want to be close to her. But Lord, I know I, sh I can't be close to her because you are working your plans in my life. Number four, Joseph goes through great seasons of discomfort. If you turn with me in your Bible to Luke's Gospel chapter 2, you have the story of the birth of Jesus Christ. But as you begin to read at verse 1, the Bible says, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinus was governor of Syria and everyone went to their hometown to register. And then the Bible says, so Joseph also went down to the town of Nazareth in Galilee, to Judea, to Bethlehem, to the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. Note what the Bible says, he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and expect, expecting a child. Please keep in mind that Joseph is now going through such discomfort, such difficulty, taking Mary and going to be registered in the census. Why? Because um, because of not, because not, not because of his plans, but because of all that has happened in his life, right? If, if Joseph and Mary were going to be married in their own convenient time, if Joseph and Mary were going to be following their own timetable, they wouldn't have gone through this discomfort. But Joseph is going through a great season of discomfort, having to carry Mary, having to go down to be, uh, to be registered, having to go down through all of these crises, because of what God is doing in his life. And also, I'd like you to turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 2. If you turn down with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 2, and you begin to read from verse 13 down to verse 23, you realize again that Joseph is going through great challenges. God is speaking to him. The Bible says in verse 13, when the wise men had gone, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to Egypt. Stay Stay there until I tell you Herod is going to search for this child to try and kill him. So you see again, Joseph has to take Mary and Joseph and he has to run into Egypt, going through great discomfort, doing things that Joseph would otherwise have not done. Look at verse 7, 16. The, I'm sorry, the Bible says, verse 19, after Herod had died, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those those that are trying to take the child's life are dead. Look at verse 21. The Bible says, So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went down to the land of Israel. And then the Bible says, But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned by the dream, by uh, one in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went down and lived in a town called Nazareth. So as you're looking at the story of Joseph, you know what you're realize, realizing? Joseph goes through great discomfort because of what God is doing in his life. There is uncertainty. Um, there is unavailability. No rooms are available. Um, there is great uncomfortable moments in the life of Joseph. You see, Joseph is going through great discomfort. So if you're looking at Joseph's life from the perspective of Joseph and what he's going through, oh, it's filled with pain. You see, Joseph feels deceived. Joseph feels devastated. Joseph feels deprived. Joseph feels great discomfort. That's when you look at life from the perspective of Joseph. You see it as a life that's suddenly thrown into pain. Now I'd like us to look at Joseph's life as Joseph begins to understand the grand plan of God. You know how the book of Matthew begins? It begins with a genealogy, right? It begins with a genealogy and it begins all the way with Abraham and it goes right down. And if you look at verse 17, that is a summary verse of all that um, Matthew has been saying in the verses that precede it. Verse 17, the Bible says, thus there were 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile, 
and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. So what is Matthew doing? He's painstakingly recording for us the genealogy of Jesus Christ to talk about how Jesus is a descendant of Abraham, a descendant of David. And as you go through all of those lines, this is what the Bible says in verse 19. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, the Mary, um, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. So she began to read this. You know what do you see? You see that God, even way before Joseph was born, he was making his plans for Joseph. So the first lesson that I wrote down is that Joseph realizes that he was selected by God. He was selected by God. You see, God knew that one day he will bring his only begotten son into this world. And when he brings his only begotten son into this world, his son was going to have an earthly father. And that earthly father was going to be in the line of Abraham and the line of David. And that earthly father was going to be Joseph. Joseph, as he looks at life from his perspective, it's pain. God, I feel deceived. I feel devastated. I feel deprived. I feel discomfort. But God, now as I'm beginning to understand life from your perspective, I see your glorious plans. Even before I was born, even before my father and mother came together, even before the generation before me came together, God, you had already selected me. You had selected me for this moment of human history. You had selected me for your grand plan for my life. And that's one of the lessons I want to place before you. You know, sometimes we feel, God, why am I here? I feel purposeless. I feel so empty in my life. But God looks at you and says to you this morning, I want to remind you, even before you were born, even before your parents got to know one another, even before the previous generation came together, I had always planned you. I had selected you for my purposes. And each one of us, we may not be, um, we may not have a purpose as special as the purpose of Joseph. But please remember, God has a special plan for your life and my life. So the first lesson I take away as I look at the plan of God is that Joseph was selected by God. Joseph was selected by God. One of my favorite verses as I think about the selection of God is what God says to Jeremiah, isn't it? It's such a beautiful verse. Let's just quickly turn in our Bible to Jeremiah chapter 1. And I want to read for you a very, very familiar verse, one that you possibly know by heart. Turn with me in your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 1 and listen to God speaking to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, God says, Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Can you imagine that? Before Jeremiah was born, before his parents even came together, before his parents could think of having children, God had planned for Jeremiah. And that's the same thing that God wants you to remember this morning, that he has made a plan for your life. He has selected you. He has a special purpose for your life. Is there somebody this morning that's going through discouragement? You feel, God, I'm just purposeless. There's no purpose in my existence. Maybe you're really uh, feeling weak and infirm and saying, is there anything good in my life? Never forget, never forget. God never made an accident when he created you. He created you for his divine and special purposes. Many of you have heard the story of Joni Erickson Tara. This beautiful girl at the age of 17 had a terrible swimming accident because of which she was paralyzed. And yet it's a story of the most powerful um, power of God in the midst of the pains of life. She's written about 40 books. She has done several musical albums. This is a lady that God's used in the most amazing way, ways. One day Jody, Joni Erickson Tara was with a group of people and as they sat listening to her speak, um, Joni had a, a canvas that was put out and she had a, a, a brush in her mouth and she was mixing the, the colors and she was painting on that, on, that, on that canvas and people were watching and she painted this absolutely stunning 
stunning, beautiful, beautiful scenery. There was a house, there was mountains in the back, and it looked so grand and beautiful. And people were just so amazed that Johnny was able to paint all of this with a brush in her mouth. And they were just, just, just enjoying the moment when all of a sudden Johnny suddenly did two strikes of black right across the canvas and everybody was taken aback. Everybody was shocked and everybody went quiet and they were like, Johnny, why would you do this? I mean, there was such beauty and in a moment you destroyed that entire beauty. And as people kept looking, Joni then dipped her, her paintbrush in new colors and she began to paint around those two black lines that she'd drawn across that particular painting. And those two black lines now turned into the most beautiful trees in front of that house and gave the picture greater depth and greater beauty. And then Joni put the brush down and she began to speak about how sometimes in life, when God puts those black strokes, when we don't understand why, Remember, he's got a glorious plan. He selected Joseph even before Joseph was born. Number two, the second lesson that I find beautiful as I study the story of Joseph is that Joseph becomes the spokesman. What do I mean? Joseph becomes the spokesman. You know, when you're reading the story of Mary and Joseph, you realize that the angel met Mary and said to Mary, you have been chosen of God. You have found favor with God. You are going to bear his son. But after that, the, the angel of the Lord only speaks to Joseph. You don't have the angel of the Lord speaking to Mary anymore. The angel of the Lord is speaking to Joseph. God appears to Joseph in a dream and tells Joseph, take Mary home to be your wife because what is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And then the passage of scripture that I just read for you, the Bible says, after the wise men left, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Then when Joseph is coming back, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, you can go back now. Then the angel of the Lord appears to Joseph again. So you see, Joseph now becomes the spokesperson for his house because Joseph is the one one who is hearing from God. Isn't that beautiful? That's absolutely beautiful, isn't it? Because some, that's, a, that's a detail that we can so easily miss out. That the story of that first Christmas story is about the angel appearing to Mary and bringing her this great news. But from there on, it's about God speaking to Joseph. And Joseph as the man who is the earthly father of Jesus Christ and who is the husband of Mary is the one who is caring for this family as he's listening to the heart of God. Isn't that beautiful? That's glorious, isn't it? Because Joseph was a man who was faithful to the law. He was faithful to God and his word. But Joseph would have never experienced such intimacy with God. Being able to hear God so clearly. Being able to hear the angels instruct him. Being able to get those words from God. You know why? Because as God took Joseph through what appeared to be the valley of pain, God was actually working his most incredible plans in the life of Joseph. Joseph, you are selected by me. Joseph, you will be my spokesman for the family. Number three, Joseph, you will see my sovereignty. Joseph, you will see my sovereignty. You know, when I read the story of uh, Joseph and Mary and Joseph uh, r running around with Mary and Joseph to different places, going for that census, going to Egypt, coming back. You you see, one of the things that Joseph must have been amazed at every single moment is the protection of God, the protection of God. You know, Joseph would have heard about how Herod killed all of the boys in Bethlehem who were two years and under. And Joseph must have said to himself, God, I've seen your sovereignty. I've seen your protection, God. I've seen the amazing ways in which at the right time you moved Mary, Jesus and me from one place to the other. Oh God, I've seen your power. I've seen your sovereignty. I've seen your protection in my life. You know, Mary and Joseph were people who didn't have very many means because when you look at how they came to, in many ways, uh, circumcise Jesus on the earth, eighth day of his birth, you realize that they could only bring um, pigeons because they did not have money for a more wealthy sacrifice. But if you would come down in your Bible 
And look with me at what Bi the Bible is saying in uh, Matthew chapter 2. The Bible says this in Matthew chapter 2. This is when the wise men from the east, the magi from the east, come to visit the house of Mary and Joseph. This is what the Bible says. Let me read for you on, in verse 11. The Bible says, On coming to the house, they saw the child and his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented them with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You see what Joseph will experience? He will experience the protection of God. Oh God, I see your sovereignty. You protect Mary and Jesus and me every moment. Number two, he would see the provisions of God. God, I would have never seen gold. I would have never experienced myrrh. I would have never experienced frankincense. But God, how I thank you that you in your mercy are a God who is showing me your sovereignty. Your sovereignty in protection. Your sovereignty in your provisions. And thirdly, God, I see your sovereignty in your proclamation. The shepherds come along and they say, we saw the angels and the angels declared to us, today in the, in the city of David is born the one who is the Prince of Peace. Oh God, I have seen your great sovereignty, your protection, your provisions, your proclamation. God, I want to thank you. Joseph looks at life from his perspective. It's a life of pain. I feel deceived. I feel devastated. I feel deprived. I feel discomfort. Now you begin to look at it from the perspective of God. You see the glorious plan of God. He selected me. I've been his spokesman. I've seen his sovereignty. And most importantly, I see how special I am to him. I see how special I am to him. You know, none of you would be talking about me if it was not for the fact that God chose me. I'm just an ordinary carpenter, just an ordinary man with just the most ordinary dreams. But today, all across the world, billions of people know about me. You know why? Because as God called me to walk through the valley of pain, God was calling me for his most glorious purposes. Is there somebody this morning who needed to hear that message? You're going through a season of pain. You're going through a season of discouragement. You're going through a time when you're saying, God, why is this happening in my life? And God is reminding you this morning, I have a glorious plan for your life. I read several years ago of a man who was going through great discomfort and great difficulty and great pain. And one day as he was walking past a street, he saw a shop that was filled with pottery. And so he walked into the pottery shop and he picked up a pot and he began to look at that pot and he began to appreciate that pot. He tapped the pot and he looked at the pot and he said, how beautiful you are, how exquisite you are. I just feel so good. And he was lost as he was looking at the pot when all of a sudden the pot began to speak to him and the pot said, oh, do I look beautiful to you? Let me tell you my story. And the pot said, I remember it like yesterday. I was happy with my brothers and my sisters. We were all lying down on the ground when all of a sudden this man came and he dug the ground and he pulled me out of the ground and as he pulled me out of the ground I screamed and I shouted I said I don't want to leave this place I don't want to leave my brothers I don't want to leave my sisters I don't want to leave my mother please don't take me away but the man took me to a lonely place this was a place I didn't know anything about he put me on the ground and now I wondered what he was going to do he began to pour water upon me and I said to my, myself what is this man going to do and then he began to stomp on me. All of my bones were broken. I was in great pain and agony. I screamed and I shouted, but there was nobody to help me. The man then picked me up. I now look totally different from, the, from what I looked at when he picked me up. He now put me on a wheel and he began to spin that wheel around. And as he began to spin that wheel around, I was feeling dizzy. I was feeling like throwing up. I felt terrible. And then he began to hold his hand and began to shape me. And I felt like I was choking. And I screamed and I shouted and I said, somebody help me but there was nobody to help me then he picked me up I looked very very different from what I looked at when he picked me up I looked like some kind of a, a funny looking pot and then he took me and he put me into a furnace oh it was so hot and he locked the furnace and I screamed and I shouted and I shouted but there was nobody to hear me and then after being in the furnace he took me out and today you look at me and you say I look so beautiful you know, I just want to remind you this morning that sometimes when God takes us through the valleys of pain, He takes us through those valleys to accomplish His most beautiful plans for our life. And so this morning, I just want to encourage you through the story of Joseph. 
from our perspective, pain. But as, but as we look at this, the story from the perspective of God, His glorious plans. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, this morning as we come before you, we thank you for that reminder. One more time, God, as we look at all of these Christmas stories, we see, God, that in the most hopeless situations, you are able to bring about the most glorious hope. God, we think of the story of Joseph, such pain. And yet, Lord, as we look at the story of Joseph, we see the most glorious plans of our Father in heaven. Lord, this morning, I want to pray for every individual and family that is part of this service. I pray that, Lord, you would minister deeply to their life. If there is somebody that is going through pain that they cannot understand, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would remind them that you have the most glorious plan in their life. Be with each one of us through this week. Help us to walk a closer walk with you. Be honored in our lives. Be glorified. And now we pray that the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with each one of us, both now and forevermore. Amen.